Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for the slight delay in commencement of the program. Uh, Professor Michael Paragon, who is chairing the session, he has been trying to join. Yeah, he has just joined the meeting. Um, thank you all for waiting. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Manjusha Kurupaka to the KCHR webinar series uh, for giving the lecture, Imagining the Banda Massacre in the 17th Century Dutch Republic. Before we start the program, I request the audience to please uh, keep your microphones on mute uh, for the duration of the lecture. Um, after the uh, lecture, we will have a question answer session, which we usually do in this way. People type the questions into the chat box and we will read it out for the benefit of the speaker. And if we still have some time left, we will, and if someone wishes to raise a question directly to the speaker, uh, if we have time, we can also do that. So, um, Professor Michael Paragon also has joined the meeting. So, without much ado, I request Professor Michael Paragon to kindly take over the session. Um, Dr. Manjusha Kurupat and um, friends, um, I'm extremely happy to uh, welcome uh, Manjusha to this um, gathering. Uh, it's not often that we get the chance to listen to a specialist on uh, Southeast Asian uh, history, particularly Indonesian history. Um, and um, it, it's a delight that it is uh, being delivered by uh, somebody who is well trained in that area. Um, Dr. Manjusha has um, already had her education in um, Leiden uh, University, uh, with which the KCHR is, uh, let me claim, is about to sign uh, an MOU soon. Um, We've been struggling with the governmental machinery to get everything uh, approved so that we can sign it. And then uh, we will have a, a period of cooperation between uh, the Leiden, uh, which is, of course, known all over the world as one of the best universities. Um, and of course, KCHR. Um, I have my own personal memories of time spent and uh, people whom I met there long ago, much long ago. Uh, and uh, people like Dick Kolf and others who made my stay in uh, various times uh, stay in Leiden very, very endurable. Um, of course, the subject that she is going to talk uh, I'm not very, very familiar with this. I'm not very familiar with this particular um, topic, only that I've also heard about the so-called Banta massacre. Um, like many other uh, such genocidal kind of uh, attack on various uh, uh, people who the Europeans in their expansionist days uh, captured and made or enslaved to their ideas of development and progress. Uh, the Bandas also, uh, or the Bantanese, uh, as, uh, uh, the Bantanese also becomes um, a part of the, uh, of the colonial memory of, of large number of people. Uh, but uh, what exactly happened and, and all that, uh, that of course depends upon the later versions that we all come to know of. And um, as I understand it, uh, Dr. Manjusha will be talking about how the whole um, incident was portrayed in, in different, uh, from different perspectives, which itself must be a very, very, very interesting uh, interesting for us uh, long after it has happened and all that for those who suffered and who 
died. Uh, it remains, of course, a big tragedy. Uh, and those who had to suffer even generations after. Uh, I don't want to go uh, deep into it. Uh, only thing I should, uh, being an old man, I think I've got the liberty to, 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 to use that, to say that, you know, Indonesia happened to be the first foreign country which I visited way back in 1969. <laughs> it's a very, very long time ago. And <clears throat> the, of course, being the first country that I saw outside India, I literally fell in love with that country. And I keep my contacts with the Academia of that region uh, even now. Uh, welcome, and uh, uh, we are all looking forward to listening to you, uh, Dr. Manjusha. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tarkan, for that uh, uh, for that very kind introduction, and uh, uh, and I do hope that the that the memorandum goes through and uh, and and, uh, and that the KCHR can in fact uh, uh, work with Leiden University uh, in training uh, archivists in the Netherlands. Um, so let me start by sharing my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to use. Right, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you KCHR for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my uh, lecture here. My paper is titled Imagining the Banda Massacre in the 17th Century Dutch Republic. So what on earth am I talking about? So I think I should give you some background knowledge on my subject to start with. So most of us here would be familiar with the history of Kerala in some shape or form. And we would know that the spice trade was very important for Kerala history. Pepper was the black gold and merchants flocked on the Malabar coast to buy the spice. Incidentally, Kerala was not the only place in the world that produced pepper. So if I was a merchant in the 17th century and I could not purchase uh, pepper here, I could travel eastwards to another pepper producing region, which is the island of Sumatra in present day Indonesia. Now let me introduce you to another spice called nutmeg, which we in Malayalam know as Jadikya. Now nutmeg in the 17th century was rather special. It was only grown in a group of 10 islands called the Banda Islands in current day Indonesia. And these islands are so small that maps usually don't even mark them out. And what is interesting is that in the 17th century, if you wanted to buy nutmeg firsthand, you could only buy it in this part of the world and nowhere else. So the Banda Islands as a result attracted merchants from far and wide who bought nutmeg as well as the derivative spice called maize. And these spices were then sold on to other places as far away as West Asia and Europe. So when the Portuguese arrived in Asia in the 1490s, they joined in this spice of nutmeg and maize as it was. Now in the 17th century, they had other competitors. The first of these European competitors was the English East India Company. Now the English East India Co Company does not really require much of an introduction because I think all of us have grown up with a steady dose of East India Company history. But the second company and the lesser known company was the Dutch East India Company. Now this enterprise was established in the Dutch Republic which in the present day we know as the Netherlands. 
Now, this enterprise was established for the very same reasons that the English East India Company came into being. They sought to set up a series of establishments across Asia to buy spices, cotton, silk, and other valuable commodities, which they sought to sell in other parts of Asia, as well as to bring back to Europe. So in the 200 years that they functioned in Asia, they created a sprawling empire of trade. So they had establishments in Kerala, in Tamil Nadu, Bihar, Bengal, Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, and most importantly, Indonesia. Now, because the Dutch wanted exactly the same things in Asia as the Portuguese and the English, it brought them into conflict with them. Now, in the Banda Islands, each of these parties vied to secure a monopoly in the, in the nutmeg trade. So the Dutch arrived in the Banda Islands in 1599. And what they did was that they sought to use violence to force the local inhabitants, called the Bandanese, to sign exclusive trading contracts with them. And with this, the Bandanese were obliged to sell their nutmeg only to the Dutch. But the Portuguese and English were using similar pressure tactics on the Bandanese at the very same time. So this was a period where every party was allying itself with the other party based on convenience. So there were times when the Dutch were allying themselves with the English, and there were other times when they were fighting with the English. So the Bandanese similarly thought that it was expedient to ally themselves with these different European powers in different parts of time. So this is a brief recap of what was happening in the Banda Islands before 1621. Now, in 1621, which is exactly 400 years ago, the Banda massacre took place. The Dutch East India Company, led by its governor general, Jan Peterson Kuhn, conquered the islands in order to control the nutmeg and maize trade. Now, he also did this in order to prevent the Portuguese and the English from claiming the islands for themselves. But the process of takeover was not easy. The Bandanese put up a stiff resistance. And as a result, thousands of them were killed in battle. Many of them died of hunger trying to evade Dutch capture. And several hundreds of them were taken as slaves to Batavia which was the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company. Batavia in the present day is known as Jakarta, which is the capital of Indonesia. Now, after the conquest, the Banda Islands were converted into a nutmeg plantation colony under Dutch control. But because very few local Bandanese remained after the conquest, the Dutch now brought in slaves from the neighboring islands as well as from places as far away as South India and Bengal to work on their nutmeg plantations. And Banda remained a part of the Dutch empire until Indonesia became independent in 1945. So the very thought of thousands of people being killed because a company wanted to monopolize the trade in a humble spice would send a shiver down your spines. But curiously, this episode has not always attracted the horror that it now invokes. In fact, it was only in the 19th century that this episode was heavily criticized and was regarded as a black page in Dutch history. So in my lecture, what I try and do is that I look at the kind of stories that were told in writing about the Banda massacre back home in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century. Now, with regard to the theoretical framework, there are two key works which look at the cultural foundations of empire. And these are Edward Said's very influential books, Orientalism and Culture and Imperialism. Edward Said defines culture as a structure of attitude or reference uh, 
across a variety of contexts, ranging from specialized knowledge in learned disciplines to narratives, travel tales, and explorations. And Edward Said says that empire influences culture on two fronts. Firstly, it creates a dominant discourse. Now this dominant discourse that he also refers to as the cultural archive is the ideological foundation for colonial rule. So to put it simply, it is the justification that the colonizer used for colonization. So to understand how this theory works within a context that we're familiar with, let us look at British rule in India. The British justified their rule over India on the grounds that the Indians were simply incapable of ruling themselves. And hence, the British claimed they had no choice but to rule India. Now, the second point that Edward Said makes is that imperial culture does not discuss colonial excesses, such as the violence that was used in the process of conquest. Now, in the Dutch context, it means that in the 17th century, people living in the Dutch Republic did not know of the kind of violent acts that their countrymen were engaging in, in other parts of the world. Like Saeed, the Dutch anthropologist named Gloria Wecker also speaks about the idea of the dominant discourse or the cultural archive. Now, referring specifically to the Dutch experience, she says that the cultural archive has not only legitimized colonization, but it has also become a very important part of Dutch identity. So much so that in the modern day, people in the Netherlands look back at their colonial past with pride. And when doing this, they forget to speak about or even remember the fact that the Dutch had engaged in a very big way in the global slave trade and that they had used a considerable amount of brutality to put down the independence movements in 20th century Indonesia. So in view of these theorizations, I look at narratives of the Banda massacre from the 17th century to ask three questions. The first question is what is colonial culture? How did print culture influence the making of colonial culture? And how do we make sense of the cultural archive in the context of the massacre? So to answer these three questions, I take a look at two categories of written accounts. Now the first category of written accounts comprise of company correspondence. So these were essentially private letters which were written by company employees in Asia to their superiors. So because these works were not published in the period, it meant that very few people had access to the content in them. The second set of accounts were published in the 17th century Dutch Republic because the Dutch Republic in the period had a thriving print culture and a very high literacy rate for the period. So these accounts were published and because they were published, they were accessed by a far greater number of people. So let me look at the first set of accounts that were written about the massacre. So as I mentioned before, these works were shielded away from the public eye in the period that we are concerned with. So the first of these accounts are letters which were written by the architect of the Bandanese massacre, who was Jan Peterson Kuhn. So Jan Peterson Kuhn was writing these letters to the directors of the company in Amsterdam in 1621. And all that we know about the Banda massacre today comes from him, his letters because they are extremely descriptive. They're very detailed. So they describe events that take place from the time that Kun left Batavia or present day Jakarta and sailed all the way to the Banda Islands. So this letter plots events from early 1621 till the end of the year. So Kun reaches the Banda Islands in February 1621 with nearly 2,000 troops. 
So his first two attempts to take the islands are unsuccessful. And he bitterly blamed these failures on the plotting of the English, who he said had conspired with the Bandanese and had assisted them by providing them with arms and ammunition. But Kun was successful in his third attempt. And what he had done was that he had taken the strategic position of Lontor from two fronts and had overpowered its inhabitants. And most of these inhabitants fled. Now the conquest of Lontor was particularly significant in the conquest of Banda because it weakened the resolve of the Bandanese living in the other islands to really put up a fight against the Dutch and it brought them to the negotiating table. But when the Dutch decided to send the Bandanese to Batavia as slaves, many of them fled. Those who remained were bundled onto ships that sailed away. Now the Dutch resorted to viler tactics to capture those who had fled. And what they did was that they, they cut out all avenues of escape by burning Bandanese boats, and they continued to maintain an armed presence on the islands, creating a kind of siege situation. So finally, when the Dutch managed to breach the Bandanese strongholds, they were faced with a dreadful sight. Mass graves in their thousands dotted the hills of Salama and Waya. And these were people who had died of hunger because of the Dutch siege. And those who had survived preferred to jump off cliffs rather than surrender to the Dutch. Now Kunz let us tell us all of these details, but very curiously, he justifies the massacre. So he said that it was simply impossible to do trade with the Bandanese because they did not honor any treaty that they had signed with the Dutch. So he said that if the Dutch had to trade in Nutmeg, they had to conquer the islands, remove the Bandanese, and then be able to trade on their own terms. And he believed that the conquest was beneficial for, for yet another reason. And this, he said, was because the Dutch East India Company was trying to control the trade of Southeast Asia at large. So he said that the violent conquest of Banda would create a reputation for the Dutch that was so formidable that any adversary in Southeast Asia would think twice about pitting themselves against the Dutch. Now, the second account in this category is called the Rapport van Persona Commandant Ost Indian, which, uh, which broadly translates as the report of people returning from the East Indies. Now, this was an account that was written in 1622 by a person called Artus Heisels, who had served as a subordinate of Jan Peterson Kuhn in Asia, and he was a bitter critic of Kuhn's policies. Now, Artis Heisels does not write about the massacre per se. He instead writes about what happened to those Bandanese who had reached Batavia as slaves. So his account tells us that once they had reached Batavia, Kun supposedly discovered that the Bandanese were plotting against the Dutch and he decided to punish them. Some of them were put to death through gruesome means and the others were separated from their families and was sent back to the Banda Islands. So although Heisels is critical of the kind of violence that Kun meets out on the Bandanese, his work is not a well-rounded critic, critique of the company, and it doesn't really criticize the conquest of the Banda Islands. In fact, it speaks rather approvingly of the fact that the Banda Islands have been converted into nutmeg plantation islands. So this work, in a sense, is only to be seen as a personal attack on Jan Peterson Kohn. Now, the third account, which discusses the massacre in this category, is titled Farhal van Eneha Orlochen in Indian, which translates as a story of some wars in the East Indies. And this was written around the same time. And quite like the other two accounts, this too endorses the conquest of Banda. So it says that these wars were necessary wars because the Bandanese are a roguish lot 
and they cannot be friends with anybody in the world. But it laments the kind of violence that was meted out on the Bandanese. And it doesn't do it because this violence was inhumane, but it does this because it says that there was nobody else to work on the Dutch plantations. So the work asks in all incredulity, could we not have retained the simplest and humblest Bandanese? Because what do we do with land without people? So to briefly conclude this section, we could say that all of these accounts endorsed the Dutch conquest of Banda, but they had very different opinions about whether this violence was necessary or not. So Kuhn certainly thought it was necessary. Artus Heisel thought that it wasn't, uh, but this was mostly because of a personal vendetta. And the last account believed that this violence was absolutely not necessary because it damaged Dutch productivity and it killed the golden goose because how were the Dutch supposed to produce nutmeg on the islands if they didn't have the labor available? Now, this brings me to the next set of accounts. Now, these set of accounts, one should remember, and this is something I mentioned previously, that these accounts were published in the 17th century. So literate Dutch people who were rich enough to buy these accounts in the Dutch Republic were capable of reading about what had happened in Banda in the period. So the first of these accounts is a pamphlet titled the Varachta Verhal or the True Story. And this, this was written in the very same year that the massacre took place. Now, because the conquest of Banda had created tensions between England and the Dutch Republic, because the English, we must remember, were also trying to conquer the islands. This pamphlet was part of a propaganda campaign to diffuse tensions and to prevent the possibility of war breaking out in Europe between England and the Dutch Republic. So it sought to dis disprove allegations of Dutch aggrandizement, and it sought to show them in the best possible light. So as a result, the Dutch are shown as perfectly reasonable in what they did. On the contrary, it is the English and the Bandanese who are shown as having violated the treaties that they had signed with the Dutch in the previous years. So the English are accused of treachery, but it is the Bandanese who are vilified to a far greater extent. The Bandanese are accused of theft, murder, and forcibly converting Dutchmen to Islam. Now, Warata Furhal, the true story, is essentially based on the letters written by Jan Peterson Kohn, which we spoke about in the first category. But what the true story of the Warata Furhal does differently is that it glorifies the bravery of the Dutch soldiers and the commanders who had participated in the conquest. And it also tells of the casualties that were suffered by the Dutch camp. And quite interestingly, or rather ironically, it does not tell you anything about the Banda massacre. So as a result, it gives you a very one dimensional account of the conquest and it tells you that the Bandanese were treacherous enough to merit a reprisal from the Dutch, but the scale of reprisal goes unmentioned. Now, the second account, which, uh, which was published, which spoke about the conquest, was Nicholas van Wassenaar's Historie Sifferhal, which translates as historical account, and this was written the following year. Now, this work replicates the first work, the true story, Lock, Stock, and Barrow. So this was essentially a faithful reproduction of the previous work. Now, the third work to speak about the conquest of the Banda Islands comes much later. So it's nearly about four or five decades later. And this was Liu van Eidzema's overview of the state of affairs in the Indies. And this was written in 1667-68. Now, Liu van Eidzema was essentially discussing contemporary uh, developments in the Banda Islands. And he devotes only a paragraph uh, for the purpose. So he speaks about uh, the nutmeg and maize produce in the islands. He speaks about the kind of birds that you can find there. And he speaks about the other commodities that the Dutch are trading in the islands. And when he concludes his account, he uh, closes his description by saying that 
there is hardly a threat of internal revolt in the islands because there are no indigenous Bandanese left because they have either been moved away by the company or they have been colonized by the company. So here, the threat, the bloodshed and the violence that had made the Banda massacre is blunted beyond recognition. So to conclude this section, uh, we would have legitimate reason to say that the true story, which was published in 1621, had more or less set the tone in which the conquest of Banda came to be imagined in Dutch print culture for the rest of the 17th century. And perhaps the most important element in the representation of the conquest of Banda was that there was a silence that was maintained about the massacre. So what do these narratives tell us about Dutch imperial culture? I think we would be right to accept Said's definition and think of culture as structures of attitude and uh, reference about the colonies. Now in the 17th century, the dominant image of the Dutch East India Company in Dutch print culture was that of a trader and a colonizer. But the colonizer image did not take into account the violence that had made the colonization possible. We undoubtedly have instances where you see the image of the violent Dutchman being presented and endorsed in print culture. And one example is a book that was written by Matthijs Kramer in the year 1670. And this was about a naval battle between the Dutch commander Balthasar Bott and the Chinese commander called Kogzinger in East Asia. Now, Kogzinger, we must remember, now Kogzinger, who was a Dutch adversary in this, um, uh, in this work, now he was responsible for defeating and ousting the Dutch from the island of Formosa, which is present day Taiwan. And with this ouster, the Dutch had to give away all of their colonial ambitions on the island. And the conquest of Taiwan by Kogzinger was perhaps the most important military reversal that the Dutch suffered in the 17th century. So when Matthias Kramer is writing about this confrontation between the Dutch commander Balthazar Bort and the Chinese commander Kogzinger, the kind of imagery that he uses is rather disturbing. So he calls on Bort to, I quote, grind Kogzinger to trifling dust. And I quote again, to step on the necks of Kogzinger and his people. So here you see Dutch violence for colonialism being not only endorsed, but also celebrated. But you must note that Matthias Kramer's works is perhaps the only exception that you will see because the standard narrative has always presented the Dutch East India Company as a trader and a gentleman colonizer. So even if you look at self-representations of the Dutch. So how the Dutch sought to represent themselves in art and architecture in the 17th century, they always sought to present themselves as very able, very gifted, very proficient traders. And sometimes you saw the image of a colonizer, but not with the violence that made it possible. But if you look at the relationship between the Dutch East India Company and Banda, it was blatantly colonial. But because the Banda massacre was never really spoken about in Dutch print culture, and this is something that I have, uh, that I have demonstrated, this meant that the Banda Islands continued to be associated in the post-conquest period only with its celebrated spices, nutmeg and maize. So this estimation that I make comes very close to Julie Hochstrasser's study of Dutch visual imagery from the period. So Julie Hochstrasser writes an article called The Conquest of Spice in Dutch Colonial Imagery, Imaginary. And in this article, she looks at how Dutch still life portraits present spices that were brought to the Dutch Republic from all over the world. And she says that there is a very disturbing disconnect 
in the sort of aesthetic beauty that you see in the way in which these spices are represented in these paintings on one hand. And then on the other, you have the violent methods in which these spices were acquired from Asia. So looking at this conceptualization, and if you think about how it applies in the Bandanese context, would we be right in saying that the silence about the Banda massacre in Dutch print culture was responsible for the disconnect? Yes. And this is because print culture can be particularly influential in informing people's mentalities and also in leaving an imprint on other cultural forms like art and drama. And I say this because I have studied 17th and 18th century Dutch drama about Asia. And what I found was that Dutch travel accounts and histories that were written about Asia in the 17th century were used by dramatists in the Dutch Republic to write plays. So it would be interesting to note that in this period, we have a playwright in Amsterdam called Franz van Steenwijk, who writes a work in 1745 about Nadir Shah's conquest of Mughal India that took place in 1739. So Franz van Steenwijk, who had never visited India, who was a Dutchman, was sitting in Amsterdam, writing a play about Nadir Shah's invasion of Mughal India, which took place six years before the time that he started writing it. So this would show that accounts about Asia that were published in the Dutch Republic, they had a readership. And more importantly, these works informed representations of Asia in other cultural forms, such as art and drama. We can argue that the massacre was undoubtedly known about in the Dutch Republic in the period, because the Dutch soldiers who had participated in the conquest of Banda, many of them would have returned to the Dutch Republic and they would have spoken to their compatriots about the episode. But we find absolutely no evidence of any debate or discussion about the episode in print. So this would mean that this silence about the massacre in print culture meant that there was virtually no imprint about the massacre to be found in Dutch culture in the period. So to conclude, I would argue that both the published accounts about the Dutch massacre, the Banda massacre, as well as the unpublished accounts, both of them together forged the creation of what Said calls a cultural archive. Now this meant that a certain version of events about the conquest of Banda was privileged. And this version, so this story that was published and this story that was propagandized in the period, spoke about the untrustworthiness of the Bandanese and the legitimacy of the Dutch conquest. So in all, the Dutch justified their takeover of the Banda Islands. Now, there are undoubtedly small differences that you see in each of these accounts. So all of these accounts do not speak in a single voice. But the principal difference that one identifies in these accounts is that the unpublished accounts speak about the violence and the published accounts do not. And this is because the Dutch East India Company had censored those accounts which entered into print. And the company perhaps did this because it feared a backlash in the form of a moral outrage, perhaps from their own compatriots and very likely from their other European competitors. So in contrast to Saeed and Wecker, I would argue that this case of the Banda massacre not being spoken about in print is not essentially because of denial. It is principally because the Dutch Republic wasn't told very much in what was a very effective means of communication, print. So as a result, 
the Dutch Republic continued to celebrate the Banda Islands for its spices, nutmeg, and maize, but the bloodied sword that had actually made the conquest possible was quietly sheathed and it was put away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manjusha. So, like we mentioned in the uh, Professor Michael Ferrigan, I think his connectivity was lost in between. But anyway, uh, like we mentioned before, after the lecture, we usually have some time for Q&A and uh, we usually engage uh, the participants to type in their questions, which we'll read out for you. We already have a, a few questions here in the chat box. So shall I read them? So the first set of questions is from Meenu Rebecca. Um, so first is, I have seen many repetitions in the memoirs with regard to Malabar records. Did you come across any such repetitions in Southeast records? So I think I'll read the questions one by one so that, um, so after you respond to this one, I can go to the next Oh, one. sorry, yeah, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, um, um, so Meenu, thank you for your question. Um, so when you say repetitions, I'm not entirely sure what you uh, what you mean by that. So uh, I'm not entirely sure what the first question is. Now, with regard to the second one, was there a Dutch document, Raj? So do you mean, um, are you referring to a paper empire? So the fact that the Dutch had kept a significant amount of records. So I presume that is what you're referring to. And um, what is the native perception of the Banda massacre? Well, we do not know what the day native perception of the Banda massacre was simply because we do not have any documentation. And as far as I know, we do not have any oral histories of uh, the massacre either. So for Southeast Asia, we have several oral histories that cover the 17th and 18th centuries. So there are a lot of other episodes uh, in Southeast Asian history from the period for which you have oral histories which were written down at a later date but we do not have any oral histories of the massacre. But uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, you have archeologists who have tried to look at uh, how people living in the neighboring islands responded to the Dutch presence following the conquest of Banda. And this was mostly in the form of the fortifications that they seem to have created to stave away the Dutch threat. So if we have to look at uh, local response to the conquest and uh, local response to the massacre itself, I think this is perhaps the only evidence that we have. Thank you. Uh, would Meenu like to clarify uh, the second question further before we move on to the next one? Oh, I was simply referring uh, to uh, Dr. Bhavani Raman uh, and, and her works, you know, uh, but a document Raj, I was referring to that. So I was asking there was an empire content and empire caution in that. And then first question, uh, I came across uh, many repetitions in the case of memoirs um, when I was referring coaching records. Uh, some of the memoirs were simply copied. Uh, the 16th century, 17th century memoirs were simply copied in the uh, 17th, 18th century memoirs. So um, I, I don't remember the names of commanders actually. But uh, I have come across many repetitions. So uh, it was in the case of Malabar only. Uh, I don't know about the Southeast Asian case. So, so I was just thinking whether there were such, such repetitions in, in the records. Um, right. So um, with regard to um, repetitions, I think it's important to uh, think about the kind of genre that these memoirs fall in and the kind of purpose that they were serving. So if you look at, so there are essentially, uh, they called memories. So they call memories found over harbor. So these are retrospective accounts. So uh, the Dutch commanders of Cochin, when it was time for them to leave that position, they were writing out these reports as uh, pieces of advice about the governance of Cochin and the political and economic situation in Cochin. 
such that their successors would benefit from this information and that they could govern Cochin on the basis of this information. So I think it has a lot to do with the genre and it has to do with the fact that if you're looking at uh, say uh, the nature of trade, uh, it was quite often that you see economic slumps in trade continuing for a long period of time. So as a result, what these governors preferred to do was to copy out sections of previous accounts and then replicate them. So um, this I think is important because it has a lot to do with genre. And the second of course can perhaps also be attributed to, uh, to laziness because they couldn't think of uh, writing out an, uh, an innovative report on their own and they prefer instead to, uh, to copy what was already available. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Adira PM. Good evening, ma'am. Why there was a huge gap in publishing the second set of documents or records? Um, I don't think you can speak about a specific uh, reason for that. Um, I think it is because after the conquest, nothing significant happened in Banda to report. Because if there was something significant, then you would have seen some sort of engagement with the subject in um, Dutch accounts in the period. And they would, in the context of referring to what had happened, also think back at the Banda massacre or the Banda conquest rather, because they didn't write about the Banda massacre. Um, so, so I don't think there can really be an explanation apart from the fact that um, nothing of consequence uh, as far as the Dutch were concerned was worth reporting about from Banda. The next question in the chat box is from Jinu Jeevi. Can you summarize the battles and treaties signed by Dutch with European powers? Um, that would involve looking at a whole 200 year period because uh, I mean, what, you, what, what I think we, we should realize is that um, the Dutch had just become a republic. So they had become independent of uh, um, a Spanish domination uh, in the 16th century. And throughout the 17th century, they were trying to maintain their independence by allying themselves with either the French or the Dutch. And their principal enemies in Asia were the Portuguese. And um, I think it's important to remember that for a period of, I think, six decades, um, Portugal became a part of the Spanish crown. So there was a point in time when the Dutch were fighting against the Spanish in Manila, and they were also fighting the Portuguese all over Asia. Um, and although they were allies of the English in Europe, there were times when they would enter into conflict with the English in Asia, because as I mentioned, they wanted essentially the same things. So even when the conquest happened in 1621, uh, they were essentially allies of the English because they had just signed a treaty a few years before to support one another in Asia and to share in the nutmeg trade. But what happens in 1621 is that the Dutch decide to go ahead and conquer the Banda Islands and the English do not have the resources to join in the conquest. So what they essentially do is that they decide to side with the Bandanese, defeat the English, and in the process, sign another treaty with the Bandanese to force them into delivering a certain amount of uh, nutmeg to the English. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is from Ave Maria. Was there only Dutch and Bandanese that existed in the Banda Islands during the period that you have mentioned? Um, Yes, um, so the people in the Banda Islands, so the Banda Islands are 10 in number, of which only uh, six are inhabited. So there are four uninhabited islands and all of these islands are very small. Uh, and there is also an active volcano. Uh, so in the period that the conquest happened, I think a reasonable estimate of the population would be that there were about 15,000 people living in the islands. And, uh, and of course, we cannot speak about them as one people because, uh, because these were groups of people. So they were villages with headmen called Orankayas. And these people in turn, they had their own internal dissensions 
So they, they had their own internal conflicts. And there were times when some of these people were allying with the Dutch, whereas there were other sections of the, of the Bandanese. Bandanese. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think um, yeah, it's not Bandanese, Bandanese. Um, they were allying themselves with the, with the Portuguese and the English. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was only the Bandanese who lived in Banda because the inhabitants of the Banda Islands were referred to as the Bandanese. But what happens after the conquest is that only a few hundreds of Bandanese remain and the Dutch bring in slaves to work on the nutmeg plantations from the neighboring islands and very interestingly from the Malabar and Coromandel as well. Uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. And, um, and of course, sorry, I forgot to mention, uh, there were also other groups of people who came and settled in the Banda Islands after the Dutch conquest. So you have people from the island of Makassar, and you also have Chinese traders who come and settle in the islands, and they trade in commodities that the Dutch weren't interested in trading in. So, so they brought in supplies for the people of the islands. So, so they brought in rice, they brought in sago, they brought in vegetables and things like that. Uh, the next, I think, is uh, clarification required for Jinu. Uh, he's asking, what were the unpublished accounts which you referred to relating to the Bandhas? Right. Um, so the unpublished accounts, uh, like I mentioned, they were essentially letters um, written by uh, servants of the Dutch East India Company or employees of the Dutch East India Company in Asia. And um, these letters were being written to their superiors either within Asia or in the Dutch, uh, Dutch Republic itself. So when you're looking at the East India Company archives, so the archival material that is available today about the Dutch East India Company, a lot of it is in the form of correspondence of company officials in different parts of Asia who are writing back to the directors of the company in Amsterdam. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Maria. Just a second. You spoke about nutmeg in specific. What made nutmeg that significant for the Dutch? And what about other spices apart from meat? Right. So um, the Dutch were not only interested in nutmeg, they were interested in the trade of all spices. So, um, so the most important spices in this period were um, pepper, nutmeg, tre uh, nutmeg, maize, and cinnamon. Um, so the Dutch enter into trade in Asia because spices were very expensive in Europe. So before the Portuguese come to Asia, spices reached Europe through the land trade. So a lot of it was brought by the sea. So if you have to uh, I don't know if I can, um, sorry, can I just share my screen again? I can just probably just open out a map. I think it'll make it more, I think it'll make the explanation a little clearer. Okay, I'm just gonna have to, okay. Um, so if you look at the map of the world, um, prior to the Portuguese coming to Asia, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Okay, can I? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Sorry, I'll just try it. Okay. So what would happen is, is that uh, Indonesia was called the Spice Islands because of uh, the availability of pepper, principally, and uh, from Sumatra and nutmeg and um, nutmeg and uh, maize from the Banda Islands, and also clove from the Ambon Islands, which was situated uh, situated just north of Banda. Um, apart from the Spice Islands, pepper was available on the Malabar coast, so that's here, and you have cinnamon, which was available from the Malabar coast, but, I, but they were of a slightly lower quality, but the best cinnamon and the biggest quantity of cinnamon came from Sri Lanka. So prior to the Portuguese coming to Asia, a lot of these spices were conveyed by the sea route through the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. And then they went through the Mediterranean 
to Italy. So the people in control of the spice trade were the Mamluks of Egypt, and later, after the Ottoman Empire comes into being, the Ottomans. And they were trading with the Venetians. And hence, the Venetians were the most important traders prior to the Portuguese coming to Asia. And this was simply because of their favorable geographical presence, which was that they were, they were at the gateway of the spice trade into Europe. So they were able to sell the spices at whatever price they wanted. Now, the Portuguese, who from the 1400s start exploring the sea coast of Africa, manage to discover a way around the Cape of Good Hope. And then you have Vasco da Gama arriving in Calicut. And then they start making their way to the Spice Islands and start trading in all of the spices which they wanted to take back to Europe. So they began taking back spices back to Europe, both through the sea route and also through the land route as well. So both routes remained operational. And then the Dutch come into the scene. So why the spice trade and why nutmeg? Because they were extremely expensive to acquire in Europe and they could be sold at exorbitant prices. So the profit margin for nutmeg was supposedly 4,000% at some point. And nutmeg was used in the period for medicinal purposes and also in food. So in the kind of puddings that they made and the pies that they made. And I think spices are usually so, uh, thought of as uh, pre preservatives, but that is not entirely the truth. I mean, although they have antibacterial properties, I think the principal reason why nutmeg, for instance, was purchased was because of its uh, value as a flavoring condiment rather than a preservative. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, next question is by Jimmy. Whether the work by Eric Stocks, the British and the Raj referred to Dutch commercial establishments. Sorry, the Eric. I'm sorry, you will have to read the work to find out. <laughs> this is the, oh, this is not, uh, not the right question to ask me. <laughs> Adira PN asks, what was the significance of the monument Pariki Rante? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, at the site of the massacre today. And what was the role of lo local chiefs called Bandanis Rankaya in this? Right. So um, now, I mean, if you have to look at uh, the role of the local chiefs who are the Bandanis or Rankayas, um, I think it's important to remember that prior to the conquest, they were essentially pitted against each other. Uh, I mean, they, they were pitting these European rivals against each other because um, what is important is that prior to the coming of the Portuguese and the English and the Dutch, you just have traders coming to the Banda Islands and buying spices from the Bandanese and then selling them elsewhere. But what happens with the coming of the Europeans is that they start to demand monopolies, which is they want to force these Orankayas, I mean, who are the leaders, and hence they are the ones who are determining the kind of relationships that these people get into with the Europeans. Uh, so they try to force these people into signing contracts because they think that these are legitimate instruments of determining power and determining action. And what happens as a result is that um, with the Europeans, they were the first ones to really use violence against uh, the Bandanese. So not just the Bandanese, basically all Asian populations across Asia. And the Bandanese did not really have the kind of response to give to the Europeans because they did not have the kind of firepower that the English, Portuguese, or the Dutch had. So they found it easier to ally with one of these European powers at some times against the other. So essentially playing off one against the other. So this is what the, Yorink the Yorinkayas had done. So in the conquest, I mean, in the process of the conquest, they decide that, uh, that, you know, they, that, that they are suffering a significant deal and that they will be defeated. And they agree to signing another treaty with the Dutch. 
but the Dutch refused. And instead, transport the people to Batavia. There were at least 45 Orankayas who were transported to Batavia from Banda. And it was these people who were put to death by Jan Peterson Kohl. Now, with regard to the Parang Parigi Ramta, now I'm hearing about this monument for the very first time. So I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to tell you what it is, but I will look it up as soon as this gets over. Um, why the Dutch couldn't establish their supremacy akin to the English? I think it's a more general kind of a question. Right. Um, so a very simplistic way of understanding European presence in Asia would be to think of the 1500s as being the period of the Portuguese, the 1600s as being the period of the Dutch, and the 1700s as being the period of, uh, of, of British supremacy. So I think we forget that in the 17th century, the Dutch were a far greater entity and it was far more powerful and it had a more defined presence in Asia as compared to the British. So in the 17th century, it was, uh, it was the spice trade that was regarded as the most profitable. And the Dutch managed to secure the spice trade. And in fact, in all the battles that the Dutch were fighting against the English in the 17th century, and this particularly relates to the spice trade in Southeast Asia, the English were losing all the battles. Uh, they lost control over Banda. In uh, 1623, they lost control over Rambon. And in the 1680s, they lost control over Banton, which was very important for pepper production or, or rather for pepper trade. So it is because the Dutch could not, I mean, the, sorry, the British could not establish a foothold in uh, Southeast Asia that they really start concentrating on South Asia. But what happens in the 17th and sorry, in the 18th century is that uh, the spice trade is no longer that profitable because suddenly cloth is in very high demand. And the British now began performing far more successfully than the Dutch in the 18th century, particularly because of their control over the cloth trade. And what I think is also more important is that um, uh, uh, a lot of academics have argued that the British uh, East India, sorry, the English East India Company, it wasn't as centralized as the Dutch East India Company, which meant that it was more flexible in really uh, uh, changing itself to suit market demand. But because the Dutch East India Company was more centralized and stratified, they failed to really change when the market and its demands changed. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. The next question is from Givergi Seyem. I understand that the 17th century was a fertile period for Dutch art. I gathered during my preparatory reading to listen to your lecture that there are paintings specifically related to colonial atrocities and slave trade. Have you examined this angle? Are there paintings or illustrations relating to the Banda massacre? Um, right, so with regard to the Banda massacre, there are virtually no paintings from the period. Um, with regard to the slave trade, with regard to colonial atrocities, there are no paintings. And I think this again has to do with the fact that um, um, the Dutch preferred not to remember their, uh, their engagement in this, uh, because I'm sure it was not a very happy thought to think about the kind of atrocities they were engaging in in other parts of the world. But what I think is interesting is that you have a lot of paintings from Southeast Asia, uh, and these are often uh, within, very, uh, 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 within very familial settings. So these are uh, paintings of families of the governor general um, uh, the governor general of the Dutch East India Company, his wife and his children standing together. And with, of course, two slaves in the background. So we have paintings of slaves, but it is within paintings which were meant specifically for remembering important Dutch families. But we also have a lot of watercolor artwork from uh, the 18th century. And this was by um, uh, a priest, uh, a, Lutheran, a Lutheran minister who uh, worked in Batavia and his name was Jan Brandes. And, um, and he worked in Batavia in the 1700s. So you have paintings of his domestic settings, 
So he had employed female slaves to take care of his children. So you have paintings of, uh, of his female slaves sitting and playing with his children. So, so these are examples of, uh, of paintings that we have from the period, but uh, nothing of the Bandanese massacre. Okay. The next query is from Renu Abraham. Does the Banda massacre represent a pattern or an aberration in Dutch colonial engagement? Right. Um, so I have looked at um, two cases of conquest uh, so far. And one is, of course, the Banda massacre from 1621. And I have also studied the conquest of Bantin in uh, present day Java. And that took place in 1682, uh, where, uh, where the Dutch uh, uh, conquered it and once again defeating the English in the process. Um, and what you see here is that in both cases, they were justified. And you don't really see an alternative narrative that tells you anything about the kind of atrocities that they engaged in. But what is interesting is that about the conquest of Banton, almost a century after the episode had taken place, there was a play written about it. But when the play was supposed to be staged, people had uh, put up demonstrations against the staging of the play because it was sympathetic to the king of Banton, Sultan Agung, and it was very anti-Dutch in sentiment. So yes, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. So um, mostly Dutch works prefer to justify their colonial conquest rather than criticize it. Thank you. Um, I had a query, um, which is like in the, uh, you said that by the 19th century, this violence started getting acknowledged in the Dutch sources also. Um, I was wondering if you had an opportunity to look at these sources and if so, is there a difference in the characterization of the Banda in these, you mentioned there was a particular way in which they were portrayed in the sources of the 17th century. So does a change occur? If so, what is the nature of that change in the right. portrayal so, of the um, Banda? Yeah, of course, yeah. So um, in the 19th century, um, you have a lot of source publications that are published. Um, so these were, uh, so what essentially was happening was that uh, you have very two, uh, you have two prolific archivists, Dutch archivists. Uh, their names are J.K.J. the Younger and uh, J.A. van der Heijs. Um, and they published a series of books based on material from the Dutch East India Company archives. So it was only when they conducted this research into the Dutch East India Company archives that they actually came across these unpublished letters of Jan Peterson Kuhn and could see the extent to which the Dutch had gone in order to capture the islands. And they were the first vocal critics of Jan Peterson Kuhn in the 19th century. And what is interesting is that Kuhn also was forgotten. Jan Peterson Kuhn, I mean, despite being uh, a very important man in Dutch East India Company history in the period, I mean, because essentially he is regarded as the man who creates the empire. Uh, because I mean, because of the kind of violence he uses, he was he was able to establish the foothold of empire in the early 1600s. But very surprisingly, he was forgotten afterwards. And in the 19th century onwards, people started remembering him, and they started establishing monuments in his name. So, uh, in his hometown of Horn in the Netherlands, they they uh, they put up a statue of him in the marketplace, so that people would remember. Uh, a very influential son of Horn who had, of course, set up the company. So just at the same time that people were commemorating the greatness and the success of Jan Peterson Kuhn in Asia, there were other people who were exploring the Dutch archives and realizing the magnitude of the massacre and condemning the individual and condemning Dutch colonization itself. And this, uh, and this gains attraction and momentum in the 20th century, of course, and, 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 and has essentially become a flashpoint and a point of debate in uh, Dutch colonial history. Um, 
as a last question it's whether there are any footholds of dutch in kerala um yes of course because um when the dutch came to um, to asia in the 1600s what they essentially sought to do was to target all the portuguese establishments and to ensure that they were defeated and to take control of these establishments so to participate in the pepper trade they had to conquer um areas on the malabar coast so they first set out by entering into treaties with the samudri and this was essentially to go against the portuguese in cochin but later what they did was was that they entered into treaties with uh, the kingdom of cochin managed to defeat the portuguese in the 1660s and also managed to force the king of cochin into signing um an an exclusive uh, uh um a treaty of trade in pepper but uh, the malabar coast is different from banda because it is very difficult to establish a monopoly because it is not an island and it meant that if people wanted to smuggle pepper to different parts of both kerala or into tamil nadu you could do it through gaps in the western ghats like palakkad so establishing a monopoly in uh, in uh, the malabar coast was very difficult and of course as i mentioned before Uh, you have other places which also produce pepper like sumatra so there was i mean so it is virtually impossible to establish a monopoly but they still um, maintained a presence in the malabar uh, for the pepper trade uh, i mean on the kerala coast entirely so you have uh, you have their establishments in kollam uh, in uh, talisheri in uh, pallipuram uh, and of course cochin as well thank you Uh, we have come to the end of the questions in the chat box if there are any last minute questions kindly use the raise hand icon in your uh, and you can raise the question so i think we have come to an end of the q and a um, on behalf of kchr we would like to thank dr manjusha for this talk so this as professor taragan mentioned is a very different and new area for us also and as i understand from the messages i received before the talk and also from the participants that there are many among the audience who are currently started their research on dutch sources and on the period so it was uh, a very important opportunity for all of us to listen to you speak today um, thank you very much for being a part of the webinar Uh, thank you and thank you uh, i thank the participants for your uh, presence and for engaging with the speaker through your questions thanks a lot much thank you very much thank you thank you rachel